Welcome to the Kentucky Watershed Academy. I'm Steve Evans with the Kentucky Water Resources Research Institute. And as this part of our Water Quality Basics series, Module 2 of our academy, we're going to be looking at the physical and chemical properties. Through this study, we've been using the stream functions pyramid to guide us. In this session, we're going to be looking at the fourth component of the functional pyramid, the physical chemical functions, or the physical and chemical properties of the water itself. For this element, much is dependent upon the hydrology and hydraulics, as well as the geomorphology. We want to look at the, some of the more common measurements of water quality. We'll break these down into three general categories. The aesthetic, that is what you can see or smell. You don't need instruments for these types of measurement, just your senses. Our in situ or common field measurements measured in place and laboratory samples that are collected in the field and transported to the laboratory. So first, aesthetic measurements of water quality. Aesthetic impacts to water quality are addressed in Kentucky's administrative re regulations 401 KAR 1031, which states, surface water shall not be aesthetically or otherwise degraded by substances that A, settle to form objectionable deposits, B, float as debris, scum, oil, or other matter to form a nuisance, C, produce objectionable color, odor, taste, or turbidity, D, injure or chronically or acutely toxic to or produce adverse physiological or behavioral responses in humans, animals, fish, and other aquatic life, or E, produce undesirable aquatic life or result in the dominance of nuisance species, or F, cause fish flesh tainting. One of the most neglected senses for people in the field is their sense of smell. The smell of the stream can tell you a lot about what is going on in an area. This chart shows some of the more common smells encountered in the field and what they may indicate. A rotten egg smell could be a sign of raw sewage or decomposing uh, organic matter or a lack of, lack of oxygen. A chlorine smell can indicate a sewage plant discharge or a swimming pool overflow or perhaps an industrial discharge. A sharp Pungent odor uh, may indicate chemicals or pesticides. A musty odor uh, can indicate the presence of raw or partially treated sewage or livestock weights. A rancid or a sour odor may be a sign of a dumpster or uh, some kind of death nearby. Gasoline or petroleum uh, type of smell can be a sign of industrial discharge, illegal dumping of waste or wastewater. And a sweet, fruity smell can be com commercial wash water or wastewater. Second, the color of the water can tell you a lot about what may be going on. This chart shows some of the common colors encountered in the field and what they may indicate. A brown color can obviously be suspended sediments, construction runoff, agriculture, or soil erosion. A green or yellow brown or blue that can indicate an algae bloom or sewage fertilizer runoff or perhaps vehicle wash water uh, a white color may indicate paint or lime milk grease concrete or swimming pool filter backwash a gray color can indicate uh, gray water or wastewater especially if there's a musty odor present a a, a black or gray color would indicate a, a raw sewage discharge or other oxygen demanding waste. And the rotten egg color may be present with this as well. If you get some strong blues, uh, reds, purples, or blacks, that can indicate fabric dyes or paints, maybe inks from paper or cardboard manufacturers. And an orange color can indicate uh, a leachate from iron deposits. Visual observation at the water surface can also be helpful clues about pollution impacts or they can be caused by natural processes and it's important that we mistake the natural processes from the pollution we can see that a natural sheen can be caused in the surface uh, in the top left picture these colorful bands will crack and disperse when distributed they're caused by minerals or organic decay not pollution the top middle is a natural foam uh, bubbles located at a water drop off that breaks up quickly and contain no odor. This is caused by water turbulence and organic decay. On the top right, we see iron bacteria. Uh, the bacteria combine 
uh, oxygen with dissolved iron to form a rust colored slime in the water. This is again a natural occurrence. On the bottom left, we see uh, soap suds. These are bubbles with iridescent colors that have a fragrance. This may be caused by detergent, uh, gray water, or sewage. That's a sign of pollution. An oil sheen in the middle uh, bottom will have color bands that swirl and stay together when disturbed. This would be caused by pollution from petroleum products. And on the right side, you see sewage fun fungus. This is an aquatic filamentous bacteria associated with sewage polluted water. So it's a natural, but it's a sign of pollution. Now we want to move to the in situ or in place field measurements of water quality. Temperature is an important field measurement because the plants and animals that live in the stream are dependent upon certain temperature ranges for their optimal health. Variations above or below that range affect the life processes of these organisms. The best temperatures for fish depends on the fish species. Some species pre prefer colder waters, whereas others prefer warmer water. Most of the animals living in Kentucky streams, lakes, or wetlands are sensitive to temperature and will move in the stream uh, to the extent possible to find areas with their optimal temperature range. If temperatures are outside this optimal range for a prolonged period of time, organisms are stressed and can die. In addition to having direct impacts on life processes, warmer water uh, cannot hold as much dissolved oxygen. Lower dissolved oxygen mounts cause many negative impacts to organisms in the stream. The temperature of the water is affected by numerous factors. That may include the atmospheric temperature, that's just seasonal, uh, stagnant versus flowing water, uh, which can be affected by low flows or dams, discharges from industrial or storm waters that may, be, uh, they may warm the water, as well as riparian uh, canopy cover, so shading of the, sh of the stream. The Kentucky Surface Water Standards are established in 401 KER 1031. These laws require that the temperature is not to exceed 89 degrees Fahrenheit or 31.7 degrees Celsius at any time. The normal daily and seasonal temperature fluctuations that existed before the addition of heat, uh, other than natural causes, should also sh shall also be maintained. The guidelines also are stated for uh, monthly temperature requirements, both as a period average and an instantaneous maximum. Those guidelines are shown in the chart at the bottom of the screen. Another common field measurement is pH. pH is a measurement of the concentration of hydrogen ions in a solution. Uh, measuring pH is important because it determines whether water is acidic or basic. The scale ranges from 0 to 14, with 7 being considered neutral. If the pH is above 7, it's basic. For instance, bleach has a pH of 12.5. If the pH is below 7, it's acidic. For instance, vinegar has a pH of around 3. Most aquatic organisms prefer a pH of around 6.5 to 8. Uh, with pHs outside of that range, reducing the diversity of the stream because it stresses most organisms and can reduce their reproductive rates. Also, solutions that are too acidic or too basic may change the solubility of different materials in the streams. That is, it changes how they dissolve. For example, rocks with heavy metals may leach into acidic water because of the increased solubility. In other words, metals are more toxic and mobile in wa waters with a lower pH. The pH of a stream will vary, but it will depend on factors such as the local geology, the pH of the rainfall, and the temperature. For instance, uh, limestone, as it dissolves, uh, it may increase the pH uh, uh, as, it, as it contributes the ions into the water. Rainfall, uh, because of atmospheric pollution, often has uh, acidity to it, and so the contributions of acid rain would lower the pH of in the receiving stream. The test for pH is usually performed in the stream at the time that other samples are collected. The Kentucky Surface Water Standards for pH uh, says that it must be maintained within 6 or 9 and it cannot fluctuate more than one standard unit during a day. Conductivity is an indicator of the dissolved ions that are present 
within the stream. Conductivity measures electrical current, but there's a relationship between conductivity and total dissolved solids because ions have both a charge and a weight. In the table, you can see some of the more common uh, cations and anions that contribute to conductivity. You notice they're calcium carbonate. Uh, calcium carbonate is otherwise known as limestone. And so when water runs over limestone surfaces, you will oftentimes have a higher conductivity. <clears throat> there is an optimal range for conductivity that can vary for streams, but if the conductivity is elevated because of too much salts in the streams or other types of pollution, it can impact aquatic life. It's measured in microohms per centimeter or microsiemens, depending on the notation. And again, high levels may be an indicator of excessive pollution. Organisms regulate their internal water levels through a process known as osmoregulation. There needs to be a proper balance between the salts and the water in your body to conduct uh, your body's many functions. You might be familiar with the impact if you're in the water too long of your fingers wrinkling up. Well, freshwater fish have higher solute levels than their surrounding waters. They may sp maintain these levels to survive. Increasing levels of salinity or salt in water bodies can cause more water inside of the fish's body to flow out into their surroundings. And so extreme levels, this can lead to dehydration or even death for aquatic organisms. So think about the difference between a saltwater aquarium and a freshwater aquarium. Few fish can live in both. Uh, fish and macroinvertebrate gills function in a set range of salinity or conductivity. High concentrations of road salts and other dissolved ions can kill off sensitive species. Another common field parameter is dissolved oxygen. Most aquatic organisms obtain the oxygen they need to survive from the oxygen dissolved in the water. Oxygen enters the water from the atmosphere and from the groundwater. The dissolved oxygen concentration can vary based on many factors. Cold water can hold more dissolved oxygen than warm water. In winter and early spring, dissolved oxygen concentrations are seasonally higher, whereas in warmer summer months, the dissolved oxygen concentration falls. In streams with rapid currents or riffles, oxygen is usually present more abundantly compared to stagnant or still water. Loss of dissolved oxygen will occur if too many bacteria in the water consume oxygen as organic matter decays. Eutrophication causes the depletion of dissolved oxygen. This is especially a problem in a stagnant body of water such as a lake with a large amount of decomposing material and warm temperatures. In the summer, lakes around the country may report fish kills due to eutrophication. The amount of dissolved oxygen will vary during the day with temperature changes. The Kentucky Surface Water Standard for Dissolved Oxygen is 4 mg per liter, which is the acute level, and 5 mg per liter, which is the chronic level. That is, the daily average for 24 hour period should be at a minimum uh, five, and the minimum for an instantaneous measurement should be four milligrams. Turbidity is a field parameter used to estimate the amount of suspended particles by the amount of light scattered from a water sample. More suspended particles, whether they're algae or soil or some other source, cause greater scattering of light with less light penetrating to the plants or life below. High turbidity will appear cloudy or muddy, while low turbidity appears clear. Turbidity can be measured by visual observation. That is, you can just say, hey, it's clear, opaque, muddy, etc. Or you can use a secchi disc, which is lower down into the water until you can no longer see the areas of black and white shading. And then you record that depth. Or a turbidimeter can be used which records in nephelometric turbidity units, or NTU, or Jackson turbidity units, JTU, depending on the instrument that's used in order to quantify the amount of turbidity that's present. So with that brief summary of some of the field parameters, let's now turn to laboratory measurements of water quality. We wanna give an overview of some of the common lab parameters, including solids, nutrients, alkalinity, toxics, and pathogens. When it comes to measuring solids in the water column, three tests are typically utilized. Total solids, total suspended solids, and total dissolved solids. All work in a similar manner. A uh, portion of the water sample is measured. Uh, this is put into a, a heater. The water is evaporated out, 
and then the remaining solids are weighed. In total solids, the entire sample is measured. To measure total suspended solids versus total dissolved solids, a filter is used, typically a 47 millimeter 0.7 micrometer pore size filter. In total suspended solids, it's the portion that is retained on top of the filter. So what is uh, in, in suspension in the solution? For total dissolved solids, the portion that is able to pass through the filter, that portion is measured and weighed. Total suspended solids, also known as TSS, is related to turbidity as each are used to measure the amount of solid material suspended in the water column. However, TSS measures an actual weight of the material per volume of water. Uh, this is much more beneficial as it allows the amount of sediment in the stream column to be quantified. There will generally be a relationship between the turbidity and TSS for a given stream, but it would typically be uh, site specific or, or flow specific or potentially even a seasonal. However, if one of these relationships can be established, then a more convenient and cheaper estimate of TSS can be obtained through measuring turbidity. TSS is helpful in understanding the sediment and debris in the column. The particles that may be floating within the column may be silt, sediment, sand, clay, uh, but it could also be organic particles such as algae or bacteria. As noted in the geomorphology section, much of the sediment in streams uh, is from bed or bank uh, uh, erosion, as well as for construction site runoff, agriculture, mining, and other runoff sources. It can also be due to organic sources such as leaf litter, algae, or decomposition. Suspended solids can clog fish gills, reduce light penetration, and the ability of algae to produce food and oxygen. It can also smother habitats for certain organisms. It can also indirectly indirectly affect the temperature and dissolved oxygen. Bacteria can also attach to the sediments and live there. Total dissolved solids is the sum of all ions in the, in the water smaller than two microns. Salinity is a related concept and it is the sum of all dissolved salts in the water. In clean water, quote, quote, TDS and salinity are similar. However, TDS can be higher in polluted water by incorporating organic matter and other constituents. Conductivity is also related to TDS as conductivity measures the ability uh, for electrical current to, based, uh, to be carried based on the dissolved ion concentration, while the TDS measures the weight of the dissolved ions. There's generally a relationship between the two. Uh, oftentimes it's between 0.5 and 0.7 times uh, the TDS versus the conductivity, depending on the ions that are present. Uh, therefore, if you know one, you can estimate the other. And so some field probes use this relationship to make estimates of the total dissolved solids while measuring the conductivity. Like conductivity, there's no specified surface water standard uh, for total dissolved solids, but there are some general levels around 350 milligrams that's often used for evaluation, but again, that has no regulatory criteria. A TDS can be naturally high, as in the case of uh, conductivity, in some areas where limestone is abundant. It has been found to lower fish reproduction rates, that can affect cell membrane balance for aquatic organisms, and cause corrosion and scaling on infrastructure. Nutrients are essential for life. They are naturally present in rocks, soil, water, and organisms. Two primary nutrients are nitrogen, abbreviated as N, and phosphorus, as P. Phosphorus makes possible the transfer of cellular energy and is a component of DNA, bones, and cell membranes. Nitrogen is a component of DNA, proteins, and chlorophyll. <clears throat> Because these nutrients are essential to life, they are often in limited supply in waters, having been taken up and used. Thus, when these nutrients increase to excessive levels, it can trigger a process of abundant algal growth, dissolved oxygen depletion, and the death of aquatic organisms. Excessive nitrogen in drinking water sources is also dangerous to humans, especially small children and infants. Sources of nutrients can include soil fertilization, sewage, manure and other excrement, soils and rock erosion, decomposition, and decay. Because nitrogen occurs in multiple forms within a stream, different tests need to be performed in order to determine the nitrogen content. 
One test is ammonia, or NH3. Ammonia is a strong indicator of human or animal waste discharges or sometimes cleaners. Testing in a laboratory will group both unionized ammonia, NH3, which is toxic to aquatic life, as well as ammonium, NH4, which can convert to NH3 in high pH and, uh, and high temperature. These results are called together ammonia. Uh, another form is nitrate nitrogen. This is the main form of nitrogen dissolved in waters. It can also move readily through soils. Nitrogen, which comes from fertilizer, soil, the air, and waste, is trans transformed to nitrate. Another form is nitrite, or NO2. Uh, this is typically only an intermediary form that is quickly transformed to nitrate in the waters. <clears throat> Lastly, organic nitrogen includes both living and dead uh, algae and organisms, as well as soil and human and animal waste. Total Keldahl nitrogen, or TKN, represents the total of ammonia and organic nitrogen. The total nitrogen is determined by summing the TKN, the nitrate as nitrogen, and the nitrite as nitrogen. The US EPA has set safe drinking water standard or a maximum containment level for nitrate at 10 milligrams per liter of water. If water contains nitrate at concentrations higher than that, it's considered unsafe for human consumption. Kentucky surface water standards also limit the amount of unionized ammonia, NH3, to 0 0.05 milligrams per liter in surface water systems. This figure presents an overview of the nitrogen cycle. It's helpful to understand that nitrogen can come from the atmosphere, fertilization, human and animal waste, and from nitrogen fixing plants. You can see in this figure at the top that plants can uptake nitrogen from the atmosphere, but they can also uptake ammonium or nitrate uh, from the soil and the water via assimilation or through nitrogen fixation. In ammonification, Bacteria and fungi and other organisms convert uh, ammonia gas to ammonium that it can be used for amino, amino acids. Nitrification takes place over a short time period and converts ammonium to nitrite and then to nitrate. In denitrification, uh, nitrogen is converted through bacteria back into nitrogen gas where it's released into the atmosphere. Nitrate can also be immobilized into the soil or leached from the soil into the groundwater surface. This provides a general overview of the nitrogen cycle. Phosphorus, or P, occurs in the environment mainly as phosphates, or PO4. It is naturally limited in most freshwater systems, and therefore introduction of a small amount of additional phosphorus into a waterway can have adverse effects. In Kentucky, especially in the central region, we have uh, bedrock and soils that have higher levels of background phosphorus, which can affect nutrient balances in our waterways and prompt algal blooms when there are influxes of nitrogen. Additional contributors to the phosphorus include fertilizers, cleaners, and wastewaters. As with nitrogen, phosphorus can be measured in multiple forms. Two of the most common forms that are measured are total phosphorus and orthophosphorus. Total phosphorus is actually the sum of the orthophosphate, the condensed phosphate, and the organic phosphate. Orthophosphate, also known as reactive phosphorus, is the most important and typically the most abundant form. It is the form of phosphorus that is available for uptake by living organisms. Condensed phosphates are phos phosphorus compounds that contain salts or metals such as sodium, potassium, and calcium. Uh, they are used in industry and as food additives. Organic phosphates uh, are formed primarily through biological processes. This includes compounds such as ATP, which is used for cellular em energy. These compounds do not break down very easily. They enter uh, sewage through food and animal waste. When sampling a stream, it's typical to take measurement for total phosphorus, which includes all three forms of phosphorus, as well as the particulate bound portion and the dissolved portion, as well as the orthophosphate. That's just the bioavailable form uh, because that provides the amount that's available for the algae and plant growth and uptake. Uh, the total phosphorus should always be greater than the orthophosphorus.
This figure presents an overview of the phosphorus cycle. Phosphorus has three main sources. Geological, that is through weathering of high phosphate rocks or erosion or le leaching of soils. Soil fertilization, this can include agriculture as well as urban sources such as golf courses or lawns. Uh, human and animal waste. This would be wastewater discharges are often one of the largest sources, but other human sewage as well as livestock wakes are also uh, high in phosphorus, as well as decomposition and decay of organism, organisms. Uh, phosphorus changes its form as it cycles through the aquatic environment. Uh, aquatic plants take in dissolved inorganic phosphorus and convert it to organic phosphorus as it becomes part of their tissues. Animals get the organic phosphorus they need by either eating aquatic plants or, or other plants, uh, other animals, or de decomposing uh, plant and animal material. As plants and animals excrete waste or die, the organic phosphorus they contain sinks to the bottom, where the bacterial composition converts it back into inorganic phosphorus, uh, both dissolved and attached particles. This inorganic phosphorus gets back into the water column when the bottom is stirred up by animals uh, through human activity, chemical interactions, or through water currents. Then it is taken up by the plants and the cycles begins again. In a stream system, the phosphorus cycle tends to move phosphorus downstream as the current carries decomposing plant and animal tissue and dissolved phosphorus. It becomes stationary only when it is taken up by plants or is bound to particles that settle to the bottom of pools. This chart, developed by the USGS, shows the sources of nutrients delivered to the Gulf of Mexico. On the left, we see that the largest sources of phosphorus are from pasture or rangeland, and followed by corn and soybean crops. Other crops are large contributors as well. By far the largest portion of nitrogen is corn and soybean crops, but you can also see a large portion is due to atmospheric sources. As already stated, Nutrients are essential for life, but when present in excess, they can cause major impacts. One of those impacts is a regional issue known as the Gulf hypoxia, or the dead zone. This re refers to an area of 5,000 square miles where oxygen levels are too low to support aquatic life. The map of the United States on the top right shows how much of the country drains into the Mississippi River and ultimately into the Gulf of Mexico. This represents 40% of the contiguous United States, including the state of Kentucky. On the bottom left, we see a 2014 map of the dead zone, which gives an idea of the size and the extent of this area with the varying oxygen levels. The dark red represents the lowest oxygen levels. The dead zone process is shown in the bottom right with nitrogen-rich waters entering the Gulf through the Mississippi River. These nitrogen-rich rich waters cause certain microorganisms to boom in their population. After a large number of these organisms die and sink to the bottom, their decomposition depletes the oxygen and water. Fish and other mobile creatures can move away from the low oxygen waters, but organisms that cannot flee die off. While nutrients could cause large-scale impacts, such as the Gulf hypoxia issue, they can also, through using similar processes, cause impacts on local water bodies. A small pond provides a good example of these types of impacts. A pond naturally supports a certain amount of plant life and fish life. Nutrients enter the pond and are taken up by the plants. The fish eat the plants, they die, and they decay. Thus, the nutrients are recycled. But what if extra nutrients are washed in the pond from farmland around it, or other sources? This is called eutrophication, from the Greek meaning well-nourished. These extra nu nutrients mean more plants grow, especially if the temperatures are warm. More algae, algae, more algae than normal will bloom, die, and decay. Bacteria consume uh, oxygen as they break down the decomposing algae. This process causes a depletion of the available dissolved oxygen. With less oxygen in the water, fish will suffocate and die. This entire process is called eutrophication. Some algal blooms contain organisms that produce toxins that can be harmful to humans and animals. These are called harmful algal blooms. Not every algal bloom is a harmful algal bloom. Continuing on this topic of oxygen consumption through aerobic decomposition, it is important to mention the term biochemical oxygen demand or BOD. This is a measurement of the amount of oxygen consumed by microorganisms 
as they decompose organic matter in a water body. BOD also measures the loss of oxygen due to chem chemical reactions. BOD directly affects the amount of dissolved oxygen in rivers and streams. The greater the BOD, the more rapid, rapidly oxygen is depleted in the stream. If BOD is high, then organisms that depend on the supply of oxygen become stressed, suffocate, and die. BOD, or the rate of oxygen consumption in a stream, is affected by a number of variables, including temperature, pH, presence of certain kinds of microorganisms, uh, and the types of organic and inorganic material in the water. A river with a greater amount of organic material, such as leaves and woody debris, will likely have a, great, a higher BOD level than a, a fast-running river with rivers and little decomposing organic material. Water bodies are more likely to exhibit high BOD levels if they are impacted by large amounts of dead plants and animals, animal manure, effluents from pulp and paper mills, wastewater treatment plants, feedlots, food processing plants, failing septic systems, and urban stormwater runoff. The methods for collecting BOD sim samples are similar to steps described for collecting dissolved oxygen samples, with an important difference. At each site, a second sample is collected in a BOD bottle and delivered to the lab for dissolved oxygen testing after a five-day incubation period. BOD is measured in milligrams per liter. In this figure, we can see the relationship between the biochemical oxygen demand and the dissolved oxygen in what's known as the oxygen sag curve. In this figure, water is moving from left to right with a sewage input uh, in the middle, causing the BOD levels to jump in the decomposition zone. This is followed by a decrease, a rapid drop of dissolved oxygen in what's known as the septic zone. Continuing further downstream, uh, the oxygen levels begin to increase and the biochemical oxygen demand begins to decrease again in this recovery zone and it finally will lead to normal levels in the clean zone again. Dissolved oxygen levels, as well as pH and carbon dioxide levels, have a daily cycle of fluctuation called the diurnal cycle. This cycle is caused by two processes in algae and aquatic plants, respiration and photosynthesis. Respiration is the process in which energy is consumed to power the cells. It occurs both day and night. During respiration, plants, just like animals, consume oxygen and give off carbon dioxide. Photosynthesis is the process of producing energy within the plants. During photosynthesis, which only occurs during the day, plants consume carbon dioxide and give off oxygen. Because the rate of photosynthesis is greater than the rate of respiration during the daytime, the net effect is that oxygen is released and carbon dioxide consumed. The removal of carbon dioxide makes the water slightly more alkaline or more basic, while the release of carbon dioxide makes the water more acidic. And therefore, these fluctuate on these uh, daily values. If you have an overabundance of algae or plants within a stream, the highs become higher and the lows become lower. This chart illustrates the diurnal cycle and the relationship between the dissolved oxygen, shown in the red, carbon dioxide, shown in yellow, and pH, shown in the blue. You can see that in the morning, the noon, and the afternoon, when photosynthesis is the dominant process, carb carbon dioxide levels will begin to drop, oxygen levels will begin to increase, and the pH will also gradually increase throughout the day uh, as there's a declining influence on the carbon dioxide or the carb carbonic acid. During night, when respiration is the dominant process, dissolved oxygens begin to decrease, carbon dioxide levels begin to increase, increase and the pH level decreases as well. So as you can see, carbon dioxide follows an opposite pattern to that of oxygen and pH. Alkalinity is a measurement of a water body's ability to buffer against acidity, mainly through the presence of carbonate, bicarbonate, and hydroxyl anions. These negatively charged anions combine with positively charged hydrogen ions to neutralize the pH levels. 
Total alkalinity is reported in milligrams per liter calcium carbonate. Alkalinity can help moderate the diurnal swings in pH, providing a more healthy environment for fish and aquatic organisms. In other words, a water body's alkalinity buffers it from potentially harmful changes in pH levels. In our chart here, we can see the yellow color shows a low alkalinity situation, where the green shows a high alkalinity. In the low situation, the diurnal swings are much greater in fluctuations, whether as, as compared to the high alkalinity situation in which those uh, fluctuations are much more moderate. Kentucky surface water standards aim to protect minimum alkalinity levels to maintain healthy buffering capacity. Studies have shown that alkalinity levels below 20 are susceptible to impacts from acidity. Therefore, if alkalinity is greater than 20 milligrams per liter, it shall not be reduced more than 25% uh, by dischargers. If the levels are below 20 milligrams per liter, alkalinity shall not be reduced below the natural level. Metals are released into the surface water as ions. They may be naturally present in rocks, minerals, and soils that come in contact with water. For example, Water acts as a weathering agent on a rock, and the rock slowly dissolves and releases the metals into the environment. The most common naturally occurring metals are calcium and magnesium. These are generally the result of weathering of limestone, a common rock in Kentucky. A high concentration of metals may also be the result of pollution. Metals from rusting uh, cars or shed on parking lots, uh, runoff from the parking lot goes into the storm drains, which are then discharged into the stream. Wastewater from industry often contains metals, which end up in stream. Uh, metals from industrial activity are also discharged into the atmosphere and may be contributed into the water bodies from atmospheric deposition. Mining activities also increase the amount of metals released. In waters with a low pH, that is acidic, more metals are dissolved and the concentrations in the water can reach levels toxic to organisms and humans. When deciding to test for metals, look at the land use in the watershed. The collection of water samples for metal analysis requires uh, careful monitoring and collection plan. A number of metals such as manganese, zinc, and copper are essential to biochemical processes that sustain life. However, these same metals and a variety of others can be severely toxic to aquatic organisms in high concentrations. Metals can be toxic to humans as well if they're ingested directly in the water or if they accumulate in organisms that are higher in the food chain and are consumed by humans. The toxicity and bioavailability of many metals depends on their oxidation state and the form in which they occur. Dissolved metals are generally more bioavailable and toxic than metals bound in complexes with other molecules or absorbed uh, to sediment particles. These characteristics of metals, oxidation state, form, solubility, and toxicity, are influenced by chemical characteristics of the water, such as pH, dissolved oxygen, and the hardness. Water hardness describes water that contains a relatively high concentration of the metals iron, calcium, and magnesium. These can build up and cause scaling on pipes and plumbing systems. Hardness is mainly considered in treated water for drinking or industrial use, but it's also important to consider when assessing natural waters because the water's hardness value is included on calculations uh, for the other water quality parameters, such as the determining metals because it influences the toxicity. Pesticides and herbicides are human-made chemicals used to control pests and weeds that disrupt agricultural production. Pesticides and herbicides in groundwater and streams are a result of modern agricultural practices and are not part of the natural environment. If, pesticides, if excess pesticides and herbicides are applied to land or if they accidentally spilled, the chemicals may be transported by groundwater by soaking into the soil or by surface runoff to a stream. Since chemicals are not naturally occurring, they may persist in the environment or degrade slowly. And as they degrade, the resulting degradation compounds may pose threats to the environment. While pesticides are commonly found in water bodies around the country, they may not be concerned in your watershed. Knowing how land is used in the watershed, for example, the amount of agricultural uh, purposes that are occurring there, will help you decide if and when uh, pesticide and herbicide water samples should be collected. This is particularly the case because these parameters are expensive. Also, if you are aware of groundwater or surface water samples that have been tested for pesticides and herbicides, it would be useful to obtain the results. 
It's additional information that will help you determine all of the water quality problems in the watershed. Pesticides and herbicides are toxic to the plants and animals in streams at small con in small concentrations. Public water systems frequently test the water supply to ensure that the pesticides and herbicides are not present, since the chemicals are also harmful to humans. Many different collection and laboratory methods are used for pesticides and herbicides, and careful monitoring plans should be created prior to sample collection. The US EPA and the state of Kentucky also have strict regulations on the amount of pesticides and herbicides allowable in a stream. The term pathogens refers to bacteria, viruses, and other microorganisms that cause disease. Because there are so many different types of waterborne disease causing agents, indicator bacteria and tests are used to evaluate the risk of exposure to disease causing agent. You can ex be exposed to waterborne pathogens by eating food and drinking water uh, contained with them, or when your mucous mem membranes, such as your eyes, the inside of your mouth, or your nose, or cuts or open sores come into contact with the contaminated food or water. A good pathogen indicator bacteria test will be very easy to perform and produce reproducible results. It will be inexpensive and will have a strong correlation to the presence of pathogens. One category of pathogen indicator organisms is the coliforms. The, the total coliform test indicates the concentration of a group of 16 different bacteria that are found in soils, plants, and in the intestines of and waste of animals. In animals, they can aid in the digestion of food. Of these 16 total coliform bacteria, there are six that are found in fecal waste of humans and other warm-blooded animals. These six are further class classified as fecal coliform through another test. Of these six fecal coliform, one is a member of the group called Escherichia coli, abbreviated as E. coli. E. coli has different strains, some of which cause disease and some of them which do not. Testing for total coliform, fecal coliform, and E. coli works in a similar manner. A controlled amount of water is placed in a container with media that allows the bacteria to reproduce and it is kept for a specific time and temperature to encourage the bacteria to grow. Uh, this growth can then be counted and the number of bacteria estimated. Although not all bacteria detected by the fecal coliform test are strictly found in the intestines of warm-blooded animals, the fecal coliform test is better associated with fecal source than the total coliform test. Uh, for this test, the water is filtered through a membrane placed on media and then an incubator and colony forming units or CFU are counted after the incubation period. E. coli is a subgroup of the fecal coliform group. Most E. coli bacteria are harmless and found in great quantities in the intestines of people and warm blooded animals. Some strains, however, can cause illness. The presence of E. coli in a water sample almost always indicates recent fecal contamination, meaning there is a greater risk that pathogens are present. When a water sample contains E. coli, it does, mean, does not mean that a dangerous strain is present, and in fact, it probably is not present. However, it may indicate a pathogen, pathogenic E. coli strain and other pathogenic organisms outside of E. coli. There are different types of tests for E. coli. Some simply indicate the presence or absence of the results, for instance, the coal alert test on the left, and others estimate the concentration level, for instance, the quantitray quantification. In the, in the result on the right, the results are run, and if it's colorless, that means it's negative. If it's yellow, it means there's total coliforms, and if it's fluorescent under a UV light, that shows the presence of E. coli. A chart is used to translate the number of cells uh, that are present to uh, the most probable number, which is equivalent to colony forming units. Reg regulatory criteria in Kentucky have been established to protect against exposure based on the amount of contact that individuals have with the water body. Primary contact recreation refers to swimming activities where people are fully submerged in the water. Bacteria standards are more stringent for this designated use. This use applies between the period from May 1 to October 31, where people are most likely to be engaging in swimming recreation. Secondary contact recreation refers to activities such as fishing, wading, or boating, where there's contact with water, but it's indirect. People are not likely to be submerged. This bacteria concentration standards is less stringent and allows for higher concentrations. 
because this type of activity could occur throughout the year, uh, the, this standard applies all year round. Because of the variation that can occur with bacteria testing, there are two types of standards. One is a geometric mean of five different samples collected in a 30-day period. This concentration is more stringent. The second criteria is based on uh, less than 20% of the samples over a 30-day period. Uh, so this could be just one sample during that time period, and it is typically a little bit higher. The primary contact recreational standards are based on E. coli and the secondary contact on fecal coliform. Because oftentimes fecal coliform is not tested, rather only e. e. coli, the University of Kentucky has developed an equation to provide uh, an equivalent concentration of E. coli uh, based on that higher standard. So around 700 CFU is equivalent to 2000 uh, for the Kentucky River Basin. Because the regulatory criteria can be somewhat confusing, Watershed Watch in Kentucky developed a grading system to convey a level of concern based on the amount of E. coli. It's important to note that these grades and descriptions should be based on multiple samples rather than from a single sampling result. In addition to considering an average or a mean of sample results, the Kentucky Division of Water bases their assessment on recreational standards based on the frequency of exceedance. However, this infographic can be helpful in conveying the information to citizens and stakeholders. Microbial source tracking is a toolbox of different methods that can be utilized to help identify sources of higher fecal indicator bacteria levels. It uses a variety of different methods to identify animal waste sources, whether it be through genetic markers or optical brighteners. There's no perfect method to solve every situation, but methods such as quantitative polymerase chain reaction or qPCR uh, looks for genetic markers associated with bacteria linked to key human and animal sources, and it can be used to help clarify the source. Optical brighteners are a simple method that can be used by volunteer groups based on optical brighteners that are present in laundry detergents and may indicate household sewage contamination. To conduct an optical brightener survey, samplers place absorbent pads in stormwater outfalls with dry weather flow, not during storms, and then collect the pads and compare against pads soaked in uh, highly diluted laundry detergent water. Those that glow under UV light have some uh, sewage source present. This method will generally only be su su successful when very high concentrations are entering the waterway through storm sewers or sanitary sewage system failures. However, these methods provide some different options at different expense levels in order to evaluate sources of pathogens into waterways. In order to determine the source of pathogens, poor graduate students over the years have done the hard work of tracing down the different rates by which humans and animals will deposit E. coli in their feces. If you know the concentration of the E. coli and the flow of the stream, you can develop an E. coli load. This can then be allocated to different sources based on what's present in the area and the revolt, results from the microbial source tracking studies. This will give you an approximation of how many BMPs need to be put on the ground to address these various sources. This example shows pathogens, but there are rates for a lot of different contaminants in the scientific literature. And in your process of developing the load and allocation, you'll need to look into these literature rates in order to determine what's to be done. Having considered some of the many water quality parameters, we want to turn and look at their relationship to the stream flow. When monitoring, it is important to know how much flow is present at the time of sampling. Think about the hydrology and hydraulics, the bottom of the tier, on which the water quality sits on top of that. This enables the calculation of the total load of pollutants moving through the system. The same amount of pollution may show a difference of concentration depending on how much water is present. Concentration is based on the mass of a pollutant divided by the volume of the water. Without having measured or calculated stream flow, the value of sampling data is limited as the amount of input will be difficult to determine. The time of the sampling is also important. Storm flows will have a different pollution sources than base flows. Storm flows will capture a lot of runoff sources, while groundwater sources are regularly discharging point sources may be measured measured in dry weather flow. Other sampling plans will designate a required number of dry days, 
prior to measurements, an amount of precipitation to qualify as a wet weather event in order to distinguish between these different source types. This chart shows the results of a first flush study conducted in California. The research showed that 30 to 50 percent of the pollutants in highway runoff from a single storm event are contained in the first 10 to 20 percent of the runoff volume. To characterize wet weather sources, it is important to collect samples on the hydrographic rise and preferably during the first flush. A laboratory analysis will tell you the concentration of a pollutant in the water. However, in order to determine the load, you must also measure the discharge volume within the stream. A pollutant load tells you how much of a particular pollutant is moving downstream at a certain point in space and time. This graphic helps to illustrate the importance of having the concentration as well as the load of pollution. Bottle A and bottle B both have the same concentration. However, uh, in bottle B, because the volume of water is twice that of volume A, it takes twice as much uh, salt to have equivalent concentration. Therefore, it's important to understand both the flow and the concentration and this can fluctuate in summer versus winter or upstream versus downstream. And in order to effectively trace the source of pollution, we have to be able to compare those values. So long term observations are necessary to, to evaluate these fluctuations in load in order to understand the relationship between precipitation, land use and water quality management activities. This example shows a daily record of phosphorus loads and stream flows for Pheasant Creek Branch in Middleton, Wisconsin. The variability shown by the data sites are caused by rainfall episodes and snowmelt events. Imagine you only sampled in dry weather over this period of time. How different would the loading look? Imagine that you only sampled during wet weather. How would it look in those circumstances? So it's important to consider both the flow and the concentration over time in order to put BMPs on the ground so they can best produce the reductions and address the sources of the pollutant load. And with that, that completes our overview of physical and chemical measurements of water quality. I hope this gives you a basic understanding of the types of measurements that can be performed and some of the data that it will provide you. Good luck in your sampling.